Hello everyone, I'm Paul Moraf, Chief Innovation Officer at CogState. I want to share with you uh, some data on the use of CogState tests to measure cognitive safety uh, in the context of Alzheimer's disease clinical trials. This was a poster that we presented at the ADPD meeting in Gothenburg. The message is relatively simple. And that is that uh, you can, at the same time as using cognitive tests as measures of efficacy, consider how uh, that you could repurpose those tests and the, the measures that they or, and their performance measures to guide decisions about safety. And when I mean safety, I mean the extent to which a drug is not doing harm to an individual's thinking. So that is that we can find an index of cognition that might indicate that an individual has undergone a substantial abnormal decline in their cognition from the previous visit. So the Cogstate Safety Monitoring System essentially sets up and asks that of a clinical trial by comparing performance on a set of tests. Uh, here they are given here in table one. Uh, three tests and what we do is we ask for each individual is performance on this visit on these three tests substantially different to what it was on the immediately previous visit and, and by that we mean that decline observed is much greater than you would expect given the fact that this is in a degenerative disease uh, and that there's variability in performance that occurs over time. So this poster really essentially shows some of the mathematics or the statistics really that sit at the basis of that decision. And it goes relatively simple. We take three of the tests. So if your test battery had eight tests or the ADAS COG in addition to this, we would argue that you don't use all of the tests, just a small subset. We choose detection and identification tests because reaction time tests and measures of attention are exquisitely sensitive to, to, to decline in cognition that might occur in the context of clinical trials, say due to a new onset delirium, an encephalopathy, an exacerbation of dementia, um, a, a, a toxicity, uh, the psychomotor attention tests are exquisitely sensitive to those. And a verbal list learning test just to give us some context to determine the extent to which any changes has, has moved into cortical areas. Uh, if you look at the data analysis, essentially we use a reliable change index and the reliable change index essentially just says, uh, is the difference between this and the immediately previous visit greater than some estimate of the variance that we would expect in this trial? And what we do in this poster then is take a group of people whom we followed in the ABLE study. Uh, there was um, uh, 199 of them who we followed over 52 weeks. You can see that they did an assessment at week 12, week 24, week 38 and week 52 and just ask uh, what is the difference in the change that occurs in each of these tests from visit 12 to visit 24, visit 24 to 38, and visit uh, 38 to 52. And then taking that change, which is the expected change and the variance in that, computing the extent to which the number of people here in table three uh, were classified as having gone an unusually large cognitive decline or performance decline and we then just said if you we said how many tests would give us a, 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 a um, false positive rate of, un, of an acceptable false positive rate so this is a statistical decision so a decline in performance on the cognitive tests is not the safety event it just says to an investigator this performance has declined substantially, we need to investigate whether there's any other evidence to suggest that there's been a negative effect. You can see that if you applied that rule of requiring two or more tests to have declined by one standard deviation from the immediately previous visit, we classify incorrectly, so none of these people in this study had had a negative event. None of them were on drug at all. Um, but given this is a statistical issue, you can see that we make a classification of about 4%, you know, 2.5, 
uh, under 5% uh, classification. So these people hadn't suffered any negative effects. So this is our false positive rate. And you can see we're at about 5%. So, you know, that's P is less than 0.05 and might be acceptable to operate in a safety monitoring system. Uh, if instead we said we, we require decline on three of the tests, and you can see we've only got three, uh, that our false positive rate is essentially zero. Um, so the, the, the idea here is that for a conservative criterion for a safety event, take those three tests and define uh, a safety uh, event, something that warrants us consider um, as being a, a, an abnormal change on three tests and your false positive rate is very low. The two tests also offer something uh, that would be um, acceptable. Of course, this is part of the story. We need to push on now and show its sensitivity, but at least these data provide for us a good solid basis for understanding first that the test can be used at the level of the individual, that the tests, uh, that the statistical rule that we develop to flag or to classify an abnormal change from the immediately previous event uh, is a, it can be done. Uh, and that the false positive rate of that classification is uh, in, within acceptable limits. So now we can actually start to look at this and apply it in real time in clinical trials.